Well, um, <clears throat> we're taking a little break. Uh, we just started the book of Nahum, um, but the Lord laid this message on my heart. Uh, we're going to be in uh, Genesis chapter uh, 39. Uh, we're going to focus in on the first six verses, um, but we'll look, um, we'll dip into some other uh, parts of the, of the chapter as well. But before we, we open the scriptures and read them and, and look and see uh, what they have for us, um, I just want to, I just want to start and uh, say my week began, I'm sure, uh, the way that yours did. It began with reflections on how wonderful last Sunday was, uh, worshiping God together with his people, with my friends, with our church family. And then, though it started off that way, that's, that's not how the week progressed. Then I received the first of what would turn out to be nine confirmations of positive COVID test results from inside our church. More specifically, from people that had attended our church uh, last Sunday. One call turned into many. My mind quickly turned from joyful reflection to concern for protecting our people. Thinking about different people's gifts turned to praying for different people's health. Planning for the next church service turned to planning for closing down the church. How quickly things changed. I was on the phone for a good part of the week uh, with my brother elders and the deacons and uh, various others uh, in the church family. It felt a lot like an enemy had slipped into our church, and by the time that we knew he was there, it was too late. He had already delivered one destructive blow after another. You know, Bill Connell was supposed to teach Psalm 91 this weekend. I was really looking forward to it. I know he was too. One thing that that Psalm of Confidence mentions is how God protects the, the, the camp of his people, his people's military camp, if you will, war camp. He protects his people's camp from disease coming into it and wreaking havoc. But that's exactly what it felt like happened in our camp this last week. Pestilence had crept in and brought us harm. Nine infections reported in three days' time, and there's probably more. That's nearly 10% of our church. That's a, that's a significant portion of our people that have been affected. I wonder how you're dealing with this. I wonder if those fears that you thought you had laid to rest months ago have resurfaced. I wonder what's going on in your heart right now. How should we think through these events? Where was God when the virus reared its ugly head in our midst? I mean, didn't he promise that he wouldn't leave us or forsake us? Well, I'd like to take us on a little journey tracing some truths concerning the blessing of God's presence and what that means, what it means to be in relationship to him and to receive the joyful benefits of that relationship, particularly when trials come. I want to give you three truths to help you as you seek to understand where God is as our church reels from these recent blows, blows from the coronavirus, blows that up until this time we've really uh, avoided. See these truths as I lay them out for you. See them as bricks, bricks that you will lay next to each other, butted up against each other in order to build a foundation upon which to stand, a foundation of truth from which to build a strong house of faith. Here's the first truth. Difficult trials come to God's people. Difficult trials come to God's people. To try to deny that truth is to deny an enormous section, or sections, I should say, of the biblical record. If we know anything about life in this world, is we know that challenges and hurts and hardships come to God's people. That's brick one. Second, God promises to be with us in those trials. 
We are not left to find our way in the dark. He doesn't abandon us in our tragedies. God promises to fight for us in the battles we face. God is with us even in trials. That's brick two. And, and really that that's where I came up with the title for this sermon, He's With Us in the Dark. Third, God's presence brings us massive blessing. Massive blessing. Overflowing goodness. Ultimate joy and success, despite our circumstances, despite those trials. God being with us transforms darkness into delight. God being with us brings us infinitely, infinitely greater blessings than simply his removing us from those trials. So that's it. That's your final brick. Massive blessing comes from God's presence. So let's pick up each of those bricks as we walk through Genesis 39 and lay them in their proper place. Let's build this firm foundation as we seek to understand a week that quickly brought about sickness and shock, illness and isolation. One figure from biblical history can definitely relate. It's the one that we're going to turn to. He had a pretty pretty quick turnaround himself. Not the kind, not the good kind. Um, he turned from reveling in his father's love to being imprisoned as a traitorous slave. From wearing a special coat to wearing prisoners' chains. And it's the story from which these three bricks come. Let's, let's now read our text, Genesis 39, and we're just going to read the first uh, six verses, or rather the first five and a half verses. We won't finish verse six. This is how Genesis 39 reads. Remember what we're doing. We're opening up the very words of God and reading them loud. Let's zone in. Let's listen carefully. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. You remember the first brick I highlighted for you? Brick number one is that trials, difficult trials, come to God's people. Being his favored people does not mean we will not experience hardships. Look at how the chapter opens. I just read this verse, but, but allow your eyes now to soak up verse 1. Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had brought him down there. That's verse 1. Well, what do we learn from this verse? First, we need to understand who Joseph was. I mean, there's a lot that's assumed here as we pick up really um, in the middle uh, or, 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 you know, partway into Joseph's story. Joseph, of course, was in Abraham's line. He was his great-grandson, in fact. Abraham's son was Isaac, and Isaac's son was Jacob, and Jacob's son, the 11th of 12, was Joseph. It's important that Joseph was Abraham's great-grandson for purposes of understanding what's going on in our text. It's important that he was in Abraham's lineage because God had promised to make a great people from Abraham, a people that would be a special people that God would create for his, for his joy, for his glory. 
And that people would be given the most wonderful inheritance, the land of Palestine, a vast land, a fruitful land, a place, in fact, for God's favored people to drop anchor, a place where God would reside with them, live with his people. Joseph then, because of his relationship to Abraham, was among a favored people. It's also important that Joseph was Jacob's son. And, and, and not just any son, but it's important to notice, um, or, or rather to know, that Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. If we backed up a couple of chapters, chapters, chapter 37 gives us this kind of background, particularly in verse 3 of that chapter. Jacob, we're told, loved Joseph more than any of his sons, and he made him a robe of many colors. So not only was he in Abraham's favored people, the people that came from Abraham, and not, not only now do we see that he was the favorite son of Jacob, finally we also we also have to, to, to also know that God seemed to favor Joseph as well, Joseph in particular. He spoke to Joseph in dreams, we're told back also in, in Genesis 37, revealing to Joseph that God would use him in extraordinary ways, in fact, exalting him for God's purposes. We see that in Genesis 37, verses 5 through 9. So to recap, Joseph was special because he was in Abraham's blessed family, because he was his father's favorite son, and because God had set him apart for his special purposes. But despite all of those realities, despite, despite those facts, our story begins with Joseph not being treated like God's special man. Even Joseph was met, Joseph from Abraham's line, the favored son of Jacob, and the, the one that God would work through in very significant ways to redeem his people. Even this Joseph was met with the deepest of trials. First of all, we do not see Joseph as we open our text in Genesis 39. We don't see him in the promised land. He's not in Canaan. He's not in the, the land of, of inheritance, the land that God had promised to his forefathers, to Abraham and Isaac and even his father Jacob. But rather, we see Joseph in Egypt. That fact is emphasized. And in the Old Testament, friends, Egypt is most often symbolic for this is the place God's people aren't supposed to be. In other words, Egypt is usually code for the place of God's enemies. Secondly, we no longer see Joseph living under the status of a favored son, but rather we see that he's been sold as a slave. He's been purchased purchased by an Egyptian, no longer under a father who adored him, but subject rather to a hardened military man who saw Joseph as a mere possession, a thing to buy and to use and to control. You notice where Potiphar purchased, or rather from whom Potiphar purchased Joseph. He purchased him through Ishmaelites, we're told there, in verse 1. Ishmaelites were slave traders of that day. They would, they would make journeys through different lands and, and inevitably land up where, uh, or rather end up where people uh, had uh, some real means and power and would uh, purchase slaves from them. No longer, no longer do we see Joseph um, living in the delight of his father from Genesis 37. Now we see him as a purchased slave. The first time we read about these Ishmaelites was also back in chapter 37. It was there in chapter 37 and verse 4, we read of Joseph's brothers who were jealous of their father's love for Joseph. And we're told there that they hated him for it. Skip to the end of that chapter, and that's where the Ishmaelites uh, first are read about. 
the jealous hatred of Joseph's brothers finally had boiled over when they decided to seize him and sell them to these Ishmaelites that were passing by. That's chapter 37 and verse 28. His brothers sold him for some pieces of silver. What hatred. What evil. Can you imagine? Such a deep trial. I mean, have you ever experienced something of this magnitude? Something that you that 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 altered your existence so quickly? Oh, and by the way, that wasn't the end of it. It, it, it only goes downhill from there. D despite Joseph's honesty, his his work ethic, his purity and his devotion to his new master in Egypt, he is falsely accused of trying to rape his master's wife. That's what we, if, if we had the time, we'd look at in our chapter, chapter 39 and verses 6 uh, through 19. And finally, because of that false accusation, he's thrown into prison because the lies against him were believed. That's the final verses in our chapter. What grave injustice was done to that man of God? What dark days for the Lord's beloved? But Joseph's treatment would actually become typical for how God's people would be treated in this world. He would become a type, a type for for a type or a pattern for how God's people are treated by those that hate God and are in this world. The Bible showcases that pattern again and again. Joseph, we see here, is a slave in Egypt. A generation later, the entire nation would be enslaved in Egypt. We read about that in Exodus chapters 1 uh, and following. Many generations later, the Babylonians, the empire of the day, would enslave Israel yet again, carrying them off into exile. Friends, you see, we need to realize this. God setting his affections on a people does not guarantee their safety and peace in this world. We know this most profoundly because of how God's favorite son, not Joseph or Jacob's favorite son, but God's favorite son, Jesus, was treated in this world. He too was betrayed and sold for pieces of silver. He too left his father's loving side only to be barked at by foreign powers. He too exchanged a place of honor for that of ultimate disgrace. A son robed in glory became a servant hanging on a criminal's cursed cross. So we know a little something about how God's people are treated in a wicked world. We know this, as I said, ultimately for how the Lord Jesus was treated. If you're a Christian, you're united to Christ by faith. And he promised that his disciples should expect to encounter the same sort of things that he encountered. That is Jesus. Jesus told his disciples to expect hatred and tribulation in the world. You need only look at John 15 and 16 to see these realities, to hear Jesus' words. God says it again and again, also through the pens of Peter and Paul. Take some time this afternoon and look up Philippians chapter 1 and verses 29 and 30, or perhaps 2 Timothy 1, 8, or 2, 3, or 8 through 12, or even Peter's first epistle in chapter 2 and verses 18 through 21, or chapter 4, verses 12 through 19, just to name several examples of these truths being stated again and again. How important it is then for us not to be surprised when hardship comes upon the church. We should be prepared for such things. If we only read our Bibles, we should be prepared for such things. When calamities come, then let us not be confused or in despair, certainly. When, when wicked men try to murder our dear brother Brian by striking him with their car, for instance. When our sweet sister Ashley can't seem to stop bleeding inside, as another example. 
And yes, when COVID delivers blow after blow within the church family, let us not in such times be fooled. God's beloved sons and daughters live, you and I live in a world that's broken. A world, world that's broken by sin, that's full of hatred and disease, danger, and yes, even death. The prosperity gospel has had its horrible effect upon the church. It promises us ease and health, comfort and wealth in this world. But we need to take the prosperity gospel out back and shoot it in the head. It's a lie, of course. We're not promised such things in this world. God's love is not to be seen in our being spared from deep trials in this world, necessarily. His adoration is not to be measured in terms of safety that we experience this side of heaven, necessarily. We simply cannot be surprised then when trials come, particularly when we see that the, it, is the, it, it is the status quo, it is the normal state of affairs for God's people living in this world. So that's brick number one, friends. Lay it straight. Put it in its place. Here's the second one. Brick number two is this. God is with his people in their trials. Did you hear those words? God is with his people in their trials. God promises to be with us in the dark, in the dark days, in our trials. This truth could not be more plain from our text. Do we see Joseph in our text languishing alone as a slave? Is he portrayed as desperate and without anyone by his side? Look at what we read about Joseph's time of slavery in the Egyptian general's home. Look there at the beginning of verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. Joseph. And again at the beginning of verse 3, the Lord was with him. And we, if we skip to the end of the chapter, what about that time when, when Joseph gets thrown into prison? Surely, surely being thrown into prison, a, a convicted criminal, surely that was a sign of God abandoning Joseph, wasn't it? Look at what we read about those hard days. Verse 21, right at the beginning there, once again, the same words, the Lord was with Joseph. And again, towards the middle of verse 23 there, the Lord was with him. What a beautiful reality. That in Joseph's hardest trials, in, in his most confounding times that, that, that seemed like punishment, that seemed like abandonment, that seemed like being forsaken. In actuality, God was with him during all those times, all those days and weeks and months and even years. God was with him in his trials. Notice a key feature in that repeated description that I just walked you through. It's the name of God, that key feature. Who was with Joseph? Look back at those verses at verse 2 and 3 and 21 and 23. It was the Lord. You see the all caps there? If you're reading in the ESV, you see it. It was the Lord who was with Joseph in slavery and in prison. The Lord, of course, is the name of the God who had revealed himself to, to Abraham, who had called Abraham to himself the one who had established a covenant with him and the people who would come from his seed. He was the God who was to recreate the world through that one man. He was the Lord who would not abandon Abraham and the one who would not abandon his great-grandson either, even in his darkest times. God had promised that he would be 
the faithful God of Abraham's family, and they would be his beloved people. That was the covenant that he had established. And he made good on that promise time and again in his ancestors, but here in our text, God made good on the promise to Joseph. Even as Joseph received blow after blow, God was with him. No matter where God's people go, friends, he goes with them. No matter where they are in trouble, no matter what enemy they face, no matter what hatred or evil or calamity or virus they are confronted with, he is with them. He is with us. Joseph came to know this really well. This reality, of course, is for God's people of all times. It's it's a truth for you and me. It's a bedrock, bedrock truth, in fact, of the Christian faith. But it came to us, came to God's people, at the greatest of costs. You see, no sinner deserves to have God with them. We don't deserve to be in his holy presence. Joseph certainly didn't, and neither do you or me. Adam and Eve were banished from God's presence, and all of us are sons of Adam. We have inherited the, that initial sin, and the creation of a new people out of Abraham didn't remove that curse of sin. And so the problem remained. You see, Christ is the only one who deserves to be in the Father's presence. But what we see on the cross of Christ is God refusing the Son his presence. God forsaking Christ as he was on the cross. The Father abandoning his worthy Son, turning his back on him, treating him like the worst of sinners, so that for the purpose that his suffering and death might pay for sinners like Joseph and like us, to be restored to God's presence. So it's not Abraham's natural children then who are somehow worthy to be with God or for God to be with them. It's rather children of faith. And that's exactly what Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham who are the sons that can count those promises that God made to Abraham as their own. Your sin has earned you the suffering that Christ experienced on the cross, but for, for all of eternity in hell, that's how long it would last. You would have never paid the debt that your sin requires from a holy God if you have come to believe that and have come to see that trusting Jesus' death in your place brings forgiveness with God for you, then your faith has been rewarded. It's been rewarded with God's promise to be with you forever in heaven, but not only then, but also that his promise is to be with you in this world no matter what kind of suffering comes to you. What, an, what, a, what a beautiful promise that is, that whatever we face, God will be with us. Revelation chapter 1 pictures this. It's, uh, it's, it's in symbolic form. This is apocalyptic literature. But Revelation chapter 1 pictures Jesus, the one who died and rose again, the one that lives now forevermore, the one there is, we're told, who holds the keys to unlock the grave. Jesus is pictured as walking in power, among his people when they endure great persecution and suffering. It's this beautiful picture of encouragement that when we are suffering the greatest, Jesus is right there with us. He walks with us then in our dark days, no matter what they are. He's with us, friends. 
He never leaves us when the pandemic reaches our homes, when the church has to close its doors for a time, when some of our friends are, are, are suffering with aches and fevers, and when coughs and headaches are setting in, when disease reaches our camp, as it were, rest assured, the Lord is with us. So let us not fear as other men do. Let us not think that God, who did not spare his own son, but rather prepares us for glory through his suffering, let us not think that our God is absent from us when trials come. He is most assuredly with us. Well, that's brick number two. Are you making your foundation? Are you preparing yourself to think through those times when trials come? Brick number one is that those trials do come. They come to God's people. And, and, and they can be very hard, dark, deep trials. And brick number two, though, is that God is with us in them. And now finally, brick number three is this. God's presence with us brings about for us massive blessing. Look at verse 2 into verse 3. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. Now verse 3. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Drop down now to the end of the chapter. Again, when Joseph was thrown into prison, we read these words, verse 21. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners. Verse 23. The Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Now, time doesn't permit us to to suck all of the morsels of truth out of these verses. But allow me to make just three quick observations for us. First, any blessings that we have come from the Lord. All good and perfect gifts come from the Father of lights. Our God is the initiator, the giver of everything that we experience that's good. It is God's grace, his presence, his name that brings us blessing. The passage consistently links the Lord bringing success to him being with Joseph. I know you heard it as I read these verses. But not only that, the blessing that is described because of the Lord's, the Lord's presence it's described in incredible terms, in massive dimensions. Look again, verse 3. The Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Again, verse 23. Whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Appreciate, appreciate the depth and the breadth of God's blessings that he pours out on his people. He, he's not a God that simply gives us trinkets. He doesn't give us just colored pieces of glass to amuse us. He brings us blessings of incredible, uh, uh, incredible uh, dimensions. And, 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 and he brings blessings to us in ways that we could not have conceived of, causing our enemies our enemies to exalt us, even when, even when the trials of our life try to, the, the, the forces against us try to batter God's people down, we see Joseph being exalted in the hands of his enemies. He raises to, to full power in Potiphar's house, in charge of all the slaves and all the work, both inside his house and outside of his house. And the same thing happens when he reaches the prison. Friends, this pictures the exaltation of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Satan, 
the ultimate enemy of God and his people, tried to deliver a death blow to Jesus, to take him out, to make it so that he's no longer Emmanuel, so that he would no longer be God with us. And Jesus, just as was promised and hinted back way back in Genesis chapter 3, the ultimate seed of the woman, God's Son, our Savior, took his head and crushed, I mean, took his foot and crushed the head of Satan. He now, the resurrected one, is exalted even to the highest place, to the right hand of God the Father Almighty, ruling and reigning over this world, and even interceding for the blessings of his people. Massive blessings come to those who experience God's presence. And the presence of Christ is in his people. The Spirit of Christ dwells in us. He is ever and always with us, bringing about blessings that we could never have imagined, even in our darkest days. And that leads me to our, my second observation from, from, from this third truth about the massive blessing that God's presence brings. The first is that all blessings come from him. The second is that our worst enemies, the worst things that might befall us, none of what this world can throw at us can stop God's desire and his actual doing of bringing blessing to his people. Nothing can thwart God's heart to bless his people. The closest Joseph ever felt to God, the most love he ever experienced, the biggest blessings he ever enjoyed came during the worst times in his life. His time as a slave and his time as a prisoner. Finally, the blessings that the Lord poured out on Joseph richly splash onto others. Potiphar saw that the Lord was with Joseph and enjoyed the blessings of Joseph's success as he served his house. Potiphar enjoyed the, the overflow of God's blessings to Joseph onto himself. He, he saw that the Lord was with him. There was a testimony there. And what's more, the keeper of the prison enjoyed the same overflow of the Lord's blessings upon Joseph, just as Potiphar had. Our blessings are of the same quality as those Joseph received, but actually they're even bigger. They're of the same stuff. They come from the Lord, just as the blessings to Joseph did, but ours are of a, of a greater quantity. Because we know what Joseph didn't, that our blessings are tied to those the Father delights to give his Son. We're united to Christ by faith, I mentioned earlier. And oh, friends, the ramifications of that reality. We're united to Christ by faith, which means the Father delights to bring joy and success to us as well. The success, of course, is not simply in our earthly occupations. It's, it's not simply money or health or comfort or such things, but rather in the salvation of souls as we continue in the faithful employ of our heavenly master. He promises, Jesus promises at the end of Matthew, that he will in all of his authority and all of his power and all of his blessings go with his people as we go out on the mission. He will be with us even to the end of the age, which, friends, means massive blessing. And our union with him also means the Father's unending, eternal, massive, glorious love for his Son comes to us as well. Not even the worst things a pandemic can bring can alter that reality. Nothing. But nothing we experience in this world can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. In fact, as we endure trial in faith, even our enemies will see that the Lord is with us. 
And may, they may, in God goods, God's good pleasure, they may even taste and see for themselves that the Lord is good. Oh, might that happen. Might that be one of the blessed fruits of our trials, that people might turn from their sins and place their trust in Jesus Christ and truly live. Maybe as we testify to the goodness of God, even as our lives are falling apart, the world might listen to our testimony and place their trust in the Lord. Don't be afraid, dear ones. Don't, don't, let, don't let these times where we're experiencing some pretty distinct difficulties rob your joy your joy in the Lord, your, your trust in the Lord from you. Take these truths that, that we see here in Genesis 39. Take these bricks, if you will, and lay your foundation for even now, even now that you might stand and weather these trials in faith. He is with us in the dark. He truly is. And he brings blessings in those times that we cannot even imagine until they come. Think about these things. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, increase our faith. Help us not to waver in our trust of you when sickness and tribulation, when suffering and trials come. Help us to be prepared for them. Help us to be even looking for them. And help us to consider it pure joy when it comes. Because in those trials, we know that you will be with us. And your presence will bring us great blessing. Oh God, may it be so. Shape your people and our faith, we ask. Heal our friends and protect us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here's a closing benediction for you. It's taken from Numbers chapter 6, pretty familiar. It's the one Aaron the priest would pronounce over the people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.